not prophetic words have been spoken 2,000 years ago and are now being manifested today. We see it in Israel. We see it in the United States. We see it in Europe. We understand you really close. So we want to walk with you closer than we have before. So we yield this atmosphere, this environment to the Holy Spirit. Because you said he would give us the word that you intended for us to have. Jesus, you actually said before you ascended up into the heavens that you by the Holy Spirit will give us the next set of instructions. So we're listening now that the Holy Spirit will teach us and instruct us. Holy Spirit, every spirit in this room is submitted to you. I am submitted to you. Use me today, my mind, my mouth, my heart, to minister the accuracy of God's word. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody in agreement said, Amen. Lift up your Bible and let's say it together. This is my Bible. I am what my Bible says I am. I can do what my Bible says I can do. I have absolutely everything. My Bible says I have. I'm a believer, not a doubter. But faith comes by hearing. And hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And my life is the better. After having heard the word of faith. Amen. I was just going to, uh, just to say, I'm going through my closet. And I'm trying to wear all my old stuff before I can't wear it anymore. Because, you know, I got goals that I've set for myself. And, and I'm reaching them. So I won't be able to wear some of these in the, in the, in the year 2013. So January, I told Mrs. Hodge, you're going to have a fine man. You're going to have to buy him a new wardrobe. I said, I said yeah, you know, I'm not going to be able to wear them clothes. I've had these clothes. This, this, clothes, this right here is probably 10 years old, if not 15. Way back when the Holy Spirit confiscated. Yeah, long time. You have to keep your suits right there, last a long time. Amen, amen. Amen, amen. Well, it's time for it to go. <laughs> Did I give you your confession yet? Um, let me do this introduction before I take you to the scripture. How many have watched the news lately? And you've been seeing turmoil over in the Middle East, you understand that the scripture tell us to look at the olive branch for the signs of the time. Olive, olive branch representing the nation of Israel, always telling us to pray for the peace of Israel and for its protection. And uh, we do see something forming up that could be problematic, but also prophetic in that um, these things have been designed by, uh, by history and, and, and by the will of man. And of course, inside of the predetermination of God to bring the Lord Jesus back. And so we have to look at it very carefully and walk accordingly. We just, we just can't live a frivolous life and then make get caught unaware. You see, you, you always want to be watching, right? You always want to be ready. You don't want to live a bad life and then get caught. I guess my mama used to say, with your drawers down. That's an ugly thing. You get caught with your drawers. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So you, all, you always want to live as though you're expecting that moment to happen anytime. And uh, Peter was a uh, Peter was a uh, He's a pretty cool cat. If you, if you study Peter, Peter, he's like from the street. Because Peter would take his knife out and cut you. And then he'd curse you. And then he'd jump in the lake naked. Peter had, he had a real personality. You understand? But he, he was changed by, by Jesus, by being around Jesus. And uh, Jesus used him to preach the first sermon. After Pentecost, the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit fell. Peter came out and preached that first sermon that, um, that, that gathered 3,000 souls in a harvest. 
Well, part of that message and part of the exhortation was uh, he, um, he exhorted the people, you need to save yourselves from this untoward generation. Now, if you start doing a, a, a research on untoward, it means perverted. It means it's a perverted generation. And the peculiar thing was, he said, you have to save yourself from it. Okay, now, let, let's, let's talk. I'm, I'm just introducing my message, so. What does he mean, save yourself from it? Well, we understand through Scripture that every man has been created with a free will. So, so it's not God, even though he created you, will not force you against your will. Got it? So he's not going to make you do things you don't want to do. You have to be willing. You have to be pliable. You have to be yielding. You have to say yes for yourself. Mama can't say yes for you. Daddy can't say yes for you. Spouse can't say yes for you. You have to say yes to God for yourself. So God will put you in scenarios to try to help you. He send people across your pathway to minister to you. Try to show you his goodness and that he wants you to be preserved and saved from, a, from, a, from the wrath that is to come. So he says, you got to save yourself from this generation. Now, if you start doing generational research, you see that what we're experiencing in our day is an all-time high from what Paul experienced in his day and Peter experienced in his day. Peter and Paul was, you know, part of the apostleship team that head out the New Testament church. And uh, that baby church saw a lot of things. And so he said, you gotta, you know, you gotta be careful for the spirit of this generation. And so you start looking at it and say, what is the spirit of this generation? And if you look at it, this is a very narcissistic generation, very self-centered, have no respect for anybody, young, old, or indifferent. Have, I've never seen a generation like this before that do not respect their elders and won't respect God, say respect, you know, the, the gender, you respect women and you respect children. I, I've never seen anything like this. It, it's really, it's really veered off the course that God intended for humanity to stay on. You understand? So our generation is very, very perverted. And you, you got to be careful because we're in jeopardy of you losing a whole generation to the move of God. They, th this ideology has gotten into our schools and twisted our philosophy of learning and, and what we teach, you know. And, and, and now it's intrusive. It's invaded into the church to try to cause us to be, you know, um, mediocre and political. They want us to be politically correct. You know, I shouldn't teach you things that bring you conviction. I should only teach you what you want to hear. But see, there's a problem with that kind of generation, a problem with people that don't want to earn it, but think they got an entitlement to it. Y'all know people like that? I mean, we're raising a generation that goes to work and, and threaten you because they show up late that you better not do nothing about it. Oh, yes, you do. You got a generation now that goes to school and will make the teacher back down pull out guns and knives and then foolish parents come down because they're in the, in, the, in the principal's office and go scream at the principal what you doing to my child this generation has degraded and, 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 and Peter saw it in his day he said you better save yourself from this, this spirit to where you think you're entitled where you think you don't have to qualify, you don't have to earn it. You better save yourself from that. Where you're all self-centered. Save yourself from that. So I'm going to preach around that. I'm, I'm looking in the scripture and I know that things happen on purpose. Even our scientists say things can't happen without a cause. There's cause and effect. Well, the scripture does say the same thing. The curse causeless cannot come. Which, which tells us that the things that go on in our life is not 
accidental. Really, you need to stop looking at serious consequences and crises and situations as accidents and incidents. They're all a combination of actions or choices that we've taken. That, that's, we as humans, especially uh, Christian people, religious people, they got, a, they got this thing about blaming everything else, even God, for their outcome. And that's because they don't study enough to know that it really is our decision and choice. Choose you this day whom you will serve. Your life is a sum total of the choices that you've already made. You're living now what you made a decision on yesterday. And your future is being made today. Look at somebody say, he's going to preach so good today, I'm going to slap you. We got to save ourselves. So we got to be careful for this attitude. You got it? This attitude of, uh, of, of desert, I deserve this. Hence, we're talking about the season of Thanksgiving, which actually needs to be established on a daily basis. Now, I found some things out about this that we're going to learn. Go to Luke chapter 17. That it was actually a key principle that some people forgot. And when you forget it, you get in trouble because it's part of the process of overcoming and prevailing. Okay? Um, I learned a lot from the study of Israel. Especially um, them coming out of captivity. And uh, if you look at them, I mean, you can extract a lot of revelation. Because when they came out, when God brought them out, and all the way to the promised land, they missed their opportunity. Now, if you study the reason why, why did a nation who received so many miracles and intervention end up being turned away and, and, and moved back? This was a generation. Generation is 40 years. You have 40 good years to get it done. Okay. Where's the 40 years at, Pastor? Pastor. 40 years is between 20 and 60. All right? You know, under 20, you're too ignorant to know something. Over 60, you may be too weak to do something. Now, if, if you kept your health and didn't be foolish, you probably still got the activities of your limbs over 60. If you didn't do too, many, too much snorting and all that kind of stuff. I shouldn't be doing this, huh? I mean, you'll wear out your body, and then you come into the information that you need to know the Lord, and it's all too late now to really do something big, so you do as much as you can. Forty years is a generation. This generation was so ungrateful. Every time God did something for them, they complained. To bring them through, they murmured. He show them what they're in for, the fruit of the land I'm going to give to you. And, and they was dissatisfied and accused him of bringing them out to be slaughtered. God got so tired of their ungratefulness that he told them, you know what, you know what, since, since you don't want to appreciate me for who I am, let me give you what's coming out of your mouth. So the very thing they got to complaining about and accusing about, they experienced. And I look at it, and it all came down to a lack of thanksgiving. Now, it may seem simple to you, but when I start exegeting this, it's going to become quite clear that you may have missed an element in your worship experience. Can I continue? If you look at chapter 17, Luke chapter 17, I want to read this to you. Verse number 11. And it came to pass, as he went to Jerusalem, that he passed through the midst of Samaria, and Galilee, and as he entered into a certain village, there met him ten men that were lepers, which stood afar off. And they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said unto them, Go show yourselves unto the priest. And it came to pass that as they went, they were cleansed. 
y'all are not, come on. Master, he said, I know what you want. Go show yourself to the priest. Now that took an act of faith because you a leper. If you bring yourself into the company of whole people, they will stone you. So you had to take him at his word and you had to start your journey believing that he would finish the work he started. Here's where most Christians fail. It says, uh, and, 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 and as, wait, Lord, come on, come on now. Fourteen. And it came to pass that as they went, they were cleansed. Come on, you guys, you got to read scripture. Nothing's going to happen until you start. You, you got you to get this. Y'all waiting for him to start. It don't work like that. Nothing happens for you from the act of faith until you actually put some action to the word that he gave you. And that's where Christians fail. They're sitting around, wait, I'm waiting on the Lord. I'm waiting on the Lord. I'm waiting on the Lord. Why don't you get up? Y'all knew where I was going. My street people knew where I was going. Just get up and start doing something. And as you go, as you go, you'll start seeing a manifestation of his intervention. Now, let me continue. Okay. So, came to pass as they went, they were cleansed. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back and with a loud voice glorified God. Fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks, and he was a Samaritan. Now Jesus answered and said, we're not ten cleansed? Now here, let's set this thing up. Here goes these ten. While they're walking to show the priest, because they're mumbling, you know, you know, something needs to happen before we get there. So all of a sudden, not too far distant out of Jesus' presence, they look and the leprosy is cleansed. The leprosy is cleansed. So, so, so nine of them keep going, but one turns around and hollers out, ah! Glory to God! He hollers out, glorifying God, he gets back to Jesus, falls down on his face, and starts thanking him. Look at somebody say, he, he, he started thanking him. Now you would think, okay, you know, Jesus should be satisfied. But look at the first thing Jesus says. Jesus answered and said, we're not. Were there not ten cleansed? But where are the nine? His focus wasn't on the one. At that moment, he thought to himself, where are these other people I, I healed? As though he expected something back. I hope y'all are pulling that in. He, he expected something from them. He, he says, where did I take? But where's the nine? They are not found that return to give glory to God, save this stranger. He ain't even a Jew. This guy's a Samaritan. He comes back and give glory. And he said to them, arise, go thy way, thy faith have made thee whole. Now, we've got to exegete these scriptures. Let's pull some, let's pull some revelation out of here yeah. and extract the truth. So then, we understand by what Jesus is saying, God expects us to be grateful and thankful. Amen, amen, amen. That, that's an expectation of God for his creation. <laughs> when he gets back to Jesus, Jesus speaks over him another blessing. You're made whole. So now, so the cleansing turns to wholeness. So we need to we need to look at that. We we, we need to do, 
what does that mean? Because two different things happen. First, he's going along and he's cleansed. Wow, I'm clean. Okay, anybody ever have uh, dirty jeans? Anybody have what they call, I guess, modern jeans now with, with, with tears in them? You know, now you wear jeans. But I used to get whooping for holes in my stuff. But now it's a style. You, you have holes everywhere. Everywhere, all over you. Right? So now when they get dirty, you put them in the washer and they get clean, but they still have holes. So, so here we go. They get clean, and so they keep on going to report to the priest. But this boy, when he got clean, he comes back and says, Master, gl glory to God. Thank you. And he says, where are the others? Where's the other Thanksgiving? You're the only one? He says, I'm the only one. He says, then be made whole. So being made whole means that after you got cleansed, you was cleansed, but, but whatever the disease did to you was still intact. You, you, they, it ate up your, your, your fingers. It ate up your toes. It crippled your organs. And so God says, because you came back and because you had enough in you to thank me, I'm taking you to another elevation of the supernatural and I'm going to restore. I'm going to restore what the disease took. You better look at somebody and say, I feel, I sense, I sense a restoration season. Hallelujah. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. Yeah, I feel it. I feel it. I sense a full recovery coming. Yeah, some of you have been restored enough where you can make it, but that's not good enough. I, I sense if you get this revelation, there'll be a full recovery of everything that was taken. Hallelujah, somebody. So his thanksgiving, his intentional praise brought another level of the supernatural. He was Lord have mercy. Another, another truth. Let's extract another truth. Why, why did this happen? Why did this happen? It couldn't just been a gesture. This must be a principle. Because it provoked Jesus to go deeper, to do more than he had already done. Now what he had already done was good. But now the boy comes back, he kneels down and he thanks his, his, his God for healing him. And he goes to another elevation. So here's the truth. When that leper was walking, found himself like he turned around, glory to God, so Jesus could hear. Got back to Jesus, knelt down and gave thanks. And Jesus said, is this the only one that returned glory? So my understanding now is thanksgiving has to do with glory. <laughs> Y'all, come on. Thanksgiving is the principle of giving God glory for the things he's done in your life. Oh, you, okay, I'm going to try to help you. I'm going to try to help you. I will not give my glory to another. Nine of you got healed and kept the glory for yourself. You didn't have enough inside of you to come back and to give me what belongs to me and tell me thank you for making me ever withhold. And I know if it hadn't been for you, I, 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 I. got to understand, you only got half of what you're supposed to have. You're not finishing the process. Okay, okay. All right, go to Philippians chapter 4. See? See? We, we, we don't understand it. 
because we're in situations where we we don't think we ought to say we ought to, we, we ought not give no praise we ought not give no thanks huh you don't understand but well, i'm going through you understand i lost my job and because i lost my job i lost my house and then i lost my car and and then and then and then some of us we lost our And you want me to give thanks in this horrendous situation? Philippians 4 and 4 says, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say, rejoice. So one ain't good enough, baby. <laughs> yeah. After you done found your place of worship, he said, now when you rejoice, I want you to come right on back with another rejoice. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. What he's saying is, you got to make a lifestyle of gratefulness and thanksgiving. And no matter where you find yourself, you need to be eternally grateful for the opportunity to connect with me. That's what God is saying. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again. Say rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing. Uh-oh. But in everything by prayer and supplication with. With what? Seem like this thing is turning into a principle. We're beginning to extract a revelation here. There's something we're not doing because our eyes is too much on our situation instead of our eyes being on the one who can get us out of the situation. He says here, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So he's saying, if I do this right, if I pray and bring my supplication to God and add my thanksgiving unto God, peace will come over. Now, why is the peace? Because we, we got to understand, why is the peace going to come on me? Because so much bad has happened to me. Uh, I would even say that some of you are mad at God. You're blaming, blaming him for what's happening in your life. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. You're saying, why did God let me go through this? Why did God take my loved one away from me so early? Why did God allow this to happen in my life? Come on, see. That's where we're at. We're mad at God, which is a trick of the devil. Because he understands if he could take away your grateful heart, and if he could take away thanksgiving off of your lips, you have just sabotaged the process and you have frozen yourself in, in, the, in the middle of the journey. Hey, see, see, here's what's wrong with Christians. We think when we go through trials and tribulations that it's going to last forever. That's what we think. We think what we're going through now is going to continue infinitum. What we don't understand is what you're going through is nothing but a journey. Now, y'all passed many chicken places to get here today. You didn't stop at any one of them. Why? Because you know it was just a journey. You know there'd be more chicken places on the way, right? I, I, I'm just trying to help somebody with my little country self. Amen. But everything in prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request. Now, why, God, why, God, do I want to pray and ask you for something and then thank you first? Why do I want to thank you up front for what I'm asking you for? Well, see, God got this thing. God, think, God got this thing about his glory. That when you ask him for something, he is so, he is so, I don't know the right words to describe it. That he says, I have to fulfill this for them in order for me to receive what's rightfully mine. So at the time you requested it, he had to give it. Oh, slap yourself. All right. So, so God understands these are my children. I've already written in my word that can come boldly to the throne of grace to find mercy and grace in, in time of need. That, that, that if they pray, or pray according to my will, that that thing they pray for is granted at that time. Here's what we do. We, we pray in petition. We'll praise, walk away without thanksgiving. Because we're, not gonna, we're saving the thanks 
for after the manifestation. When this blind boy taught us that when you thank him, it's an act of faith affirmation. What I'm doing is saying, I thank you for where I am and what you've already done. And I'm thanking you that you are a good God. But what that boy didn't know, he had launched himself into another level of faith that extracted another level of the supernatural in his life. So now that we know scripture and we don't have to depend on stuff, we know scripture. Look at your neighbor say, get ready. We understand that when we give thanksgiving, it is the seal to the request. What does that mean? I mean, when I came up to you and I pray and I put my petition together, I know you so much. You're such a good God and you're all powerful, all knowing that I put my total trust in you despite the situation that I'm now in. I know that I'm facing traumatic situations. I know that things are happening in my life out of my control. But instead of me murmuring to you about it or complaining in the situation, I'm going to take this time after my prayer and my praise to say thank you because I know without a doubt you've already done it in my life and I'm just waiting now for a manifestation to occur. So in my... I would, I would, I would say that some believers have not had this has been a missing element in your life. You prayed, you praised, but then you waited. You waited instead of thanking him, instead of instead of walking in gratefulness. And when people ask you, "How's it going?" Uh, you 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 just say, "Well, you know what? I'm praising God for my prayers have already been answered." They've been heard and granted. But I can't see no difference in you. Well, that's all right. Because if you just keep on watching, if you keep waking up day and going to sleep at night, one day you're going to wake up and you're going to see a total change in my life because I'm totally convinced. You see, I've already finished the process. All right. I still got to get you somewhere. First Thessalonians 5 and 17 says this. Pray without ceasing. And in everything, give thanks. Okay, wait a minute. He said to do what? He said pray without ceasing in everything, which means in every one of your situations. He doesn't care what your situation looks like. You want to know why he doesn't care? Because he's greater than your situation. But he needs you to finish the process. He needs you to thank him in advance that you already know by faith that a faithful God is going to change this ugly mess that you caught up in. That, 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 okay, that you trust him so much, right? You trust him so much that you don't have to see it to believe it. That you believe it so much in your heart that before it even manifests, you say stuff like, thank you for my car, thank you for my house, thank you for my job, thank you that you delivered me, thank you my marriage is healed, thank you I'm healed in my body, thank you, thank you, thank you. And the devil say, what you thanking him for? And you say, I already know, Mr. Devil, that I have what I've already prayed for. Okay, let me, let me, let me go, let me, let me see if I can help you. Because he said, in everything give thanks, that means no matter where you are, you need to give thanks. See, this is a supernatural journey. See, you let your natural get a hold of you and you magnify the natural without going into the supernatural. The supernatural demands the process to be completed. So it demands that you would give him thanks in advance. Watch this. James 1 and 2. My brethren, count it all joy. When you fall into diverse temptations, tests, trials, and tribulations, knowing this, that the trying of the faith worketh patience. Well, let's deal with this for, for a minute. How in the world are you going to come to me in my grief, in my sorrows, in my loss, and tell me the joy? Count it all joy. But we read it said, and everything, give thanks. Didn't we read it? And then all of a sudden, James want to come on and, and pick up the, and extract the revelation that, man, whatever situation you're in, 
How much is joy? Huh? I'm losing somebody. How I'm gonna count that as joy? I lose my job. I'm gonna count that as joy. How people talking about me, man? Don't you understand? People don't like me. How, how you want me to walk around and count it as joy? All this stuff is, is too much for me. It's overloading me. And you say what? Count it as joy. But what we know as believers is what he said, that when we give our prayers up with thanksgiving, that the God of peace will cover us. The reason you don't have no peace in your situation is because you haven't given it to God yet. And the reason I know you haven't given it to God yet, because you're not going to thank him until you get the end result first. You're waiting to see something to thank him for. When actually the scripture says, you got to thank him before you see something. So you got to start counting stuff as joy. I'm going through with my job, but I, I counted joy. Yeah, I'm, going through a little bit. Woo! But I'm counting it joy. Back up. Joy. I'm counting it all joy. Why are you counting it joy? Because by his stripes, I am healed. Ah! Yeah, but praise the Lord, joy. You gotta, you, you gotta really do this stuff. You just can't get in here and be entertained by it. You gotta take it home with you. Where the pastor said, when I lose stuff, I need to count this joy. Okay, there you go. Joy, joy, joy. Yeah, there she go. Joy, praise the Lord, joy. There he go. Count it all joy. See, I'll rejoice. Well, Lord, I'm rejoicing as much as I possibly can conjure up in me. Joy. I rejoice. Thank you. Then the, then the revelation kicks in. Well, Pastor said, if I thank him, then I seal the deal. And the devil can't stop him because if the devil can stop him, he'll prevent him from getting his glory. So once I start thanking him on a daily basis for something I can't see, he has to manifest it because he said he's a jealous God. He will have no other gods before him and he will not allow anybody to have his glory. So now I understand a revelation. No matter what situation I'm in, I'm going to count it all joy. Why? Because I know it's going to work for my patience. What you mean gonna work for your patience? The trying of your faith works your patience. It works that perverted spirit that's trying to get on you. That sadistic, narcissistic spirit of entitlement that tries to get on you. Because you're in a situation now where you can't do this by yourself. This is out of your control. You can't call the shots on this one. You need God to show up on this one. Now you got to work a process that's working your patience. You need some patience because there's been some stuff in you that sabotaged you before. So now that you're working this thing and, and the trial of your faith is producing patience in you and God is actually extracting out of you all of those poisons that have destroyed your opportunities before. Slap somebody and say, he's talking to you. He's talking to you. But then he says, let patience have a perfect work that you may be perfect and entire. So if I just walk through this thing and thank God, I'm thanking you, Father, for it. I know you did it already. I just want to praise you today. I, one thing I learned in the church of God in Christ is how to say thank you, Jesus. Didn't we say it a lot? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We, you know, we may not have had nothing, but we sure had a solid foundation where nothing could take us away from our God. You can be like Job and lose everything you have, but we learned how to stay connected through our thanksgiving. Look at somebody and say, I need to thank him right now. still hasn't changed they may have took your car they may have took your house they may have took your job you may have to give up some of your rings and your jewelry they may have took money out of your bank but what really matters still haven't changed and what hasn't changed is that the Lord he is my shepherd and I shall not want y'all not trying to hear me up in here 
But I want you to know that what really matters has not changed. He's still holding you in the palm of his hand. Do you understand the devil would have killed you if he could? But God wouldn't allow it. He said, no, 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 no. That you still got breath in your body because... I'm still not finished with you. If you want me to quit, I'll quit. I'm I'm not finished with you. I, I need this revelation in you. Go to Psalms 107. All the old time patriarchs understood this principle. See? See, they understood it because... Because... Jesus hadn't come yet, so the Holy Spirit had not been given. So they wouldn't feel like we're filled, right? So they had to work the principles in order to get God's intervention. That's why it's written that God will inhabit the praises of his people. You got it? Because at that particular time, they were still dead because blood hadn't been shed for them. So he had principles they could utilize to get his presence in. Now watch this. Psalms 107, verse number 19. Then they cry unto the Lord in their trouble, and he saveth them out of their distresses. What did they do? They cry. A, 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 t- a type of praying, a type of communication. Oh, come on, Pastor, you're going too far now. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. How many people in here have babies? How many have babies? Okay. Don't be afraid. Don't be ashamed. Lift your hands up. Praise the Lord. All right. All right. All right. Now, we know what that baby needs by the tone and tenor of the cry. Because the, the baby is not developed enough to articulate to you in the known language what the necessity or the need is at the time. So the baby has developed the, a tone inside of the cry that alerts you and gives you instructions on what you need to do to satisfy the baby. So so when the baby is hungry, there's a different kind of cry. When, when, when he needs breastfeeding, there's a different kind of cry. When, when, when he got poop on him, he, whew, don't bring him to me. When he got poop on him, there's a certain kind of cry. Nasty, nasty, right? Certain kind of cry, because he don't like feeling like that. I don't like that stuff down there. And I want to be changed, right? And then when he's aggravated or being, uh, being pitched or in pain, there's another real kind of cry. Am I right about it? And so, and so you pick up the tone and the tenor of the cry. You know exactly. Give me that diaper. Well, how do you know he need change? I know the cry. I know, I know what he's calling for. Okay? And so what you got to understand is that there is a system that God has given to believers whereby we don't even have to utter an articulate speech. But when we cry unto the Lord, the Lord can determine the sound of my cry and understand exactly what I need at the time. So then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them out of their distress. Now, I need to know why he came. Well, let me look and see now, because that's gonna, uh, it's going to tell me. He sent his word and healed them and delivered them from all their destruction. So when they cried out, God showed up. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. Let them sacrifice the sacrifices of thanksgiving. There it is. And declare his works with rejoicing. Oh, my God. Here here it is again. Another witness. So here's the formula David documented. First, you pray. Supplication supplication and petition, you pray. Then you praise. Ah, Praise is for the one who has the ability to, to deliver you and save you. Then you thank him, which is a down payment, an act of faith that is already done. But once you do that, then you declare. Declaring is a prophetic decree about the whole system saying how it's going to turn out on your behalf. Go to Psalms 100. I got to pull you out. Hallelujah. You have to understand the process. You must make the right approach. There must be the right protocol. So David writes and documents the way to get to God. He actually shows us this process. I'm, I'm almost through. I got five minutes. I'm almost through. He says here, he's teaching you. He's, they said, I understand how to get to God, y'all. I'm going to show y'all how to get to God. Anybody want to know how to get to God? Bow your heads, close your eyes. Not enough of you want to know. Anybody want to know how to get to God? 
Look what David says. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord all your life. Okay, here we go with that joy stuff again. Here we go. We lose out. Here's what we lose out. Because we have more value on things than we do on our relationship with him. And, 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 and so even when it comes to offering time, you should see your faces. You see your faces. Now it's like sacrifice. I'm going to extract something from my being. I, I, I have to release something from my life. Oh, my God. And you get all painful. And then the Lord is looking at you like, okay, that's not joy. Because he said, even when you come to him with your offerings, it should be in joy. You got to be a cheerful giver. There got to be a lot of joy. You, you, because you understand the end result. That's why you can joy in your giving. Because you understand when you give, the seed is planted, the harvest is coming. So you up here doing this to an offering. Because you already know it's a done deal. All right, all right. So David says, here's the approach, y'all. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. See all that complaining and murmuring? It don't go over good with God. I don't know why we think we got to show God our problem. Why is it we need to discuss it? He was there look, looking at it just, he knew before you went through it, he knew you was going through it. He had already made an escape out of it, but you're so busy looking at it that you stuck in it that you can't see the deliverance he provided to get you out of it. He says, he says, he says, look at this. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. What you say? What you say here? Know what? You got to know he is God. Satan's not God. Money's not God. My employment is not God. Uh huh. That hospital is not God. You can't tell me my life is over. You don't have the last say in this because you not God. Y'all not trying to hear me. I'm trying to preach some hope up in here. Look at somebody say, you better hear him today. Know ye that the Lord is God. He has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pastor. Here we go. Here we go. Enter, enter into his gates with it's already done. It's already done. You enter in thanking him. God said, there's an approach you've got to make. You can't come to me with your pathetic complaining and your murmuring about your situation. you got to come skip to the loo, my darling. Come singing. Come praising. Come thanking. And if you come thanking, the angels will open up the gigantic doors to my altar. Can I get a little more, Jack? Can I get a little more? Just a little. Enter his gates with thanksgiving into his course with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. For the Lord is good and his mercy is everlasting and his truth endureth to all generations. Okay, so now we understand the way to get to God. David said, I know how to get to God. I know how to get in there. In fact, you should look at this very closely because there's no blood sacrifice, yet David is an Old Testament patriarch What New Testament ways. He was able to get to God without blood. Oh. He got to God. Why did he get to God without blood? Because he had his glory. He said, I got glory for you. And God said, the door's open. Come up on here. Come on, y'all. Come on, y'all. He was able to get to God. Now, now, David documents his results. He said, I know that I enter his courts with thanksgiving. I come in there with praise and singing. And this is what happens. After I pray, after I praise, after, after I, I give thanks, and I start declaring. So I already declare the end from the beginning. So what I'm going to do is say, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want him. He maketh me to lie down. In green pastures, he leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. What, what? Yeah, 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 yeah. When you've been depleted because you've been going through and everybody been talking about you. They've been talking about all that faith you've been talking about. And they teasing you because you now exasperated. But what you didn't understand was when you start saying thank you, the peace of God comes over your life. 
when you say thank you, rest a, restoration begins. He said, I'm going to restore your soul. Look at somebody say, I feel a restoration coming. Then he goes on to say, he restored my soul. He leaded me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. You got to understand what I'm talking about. I've been through a whole lot, going through a whole lot right now. But I still got gratitude in my heart and thanksgiving in my mouth. No matter what I'm looking at, no matter what I'm facing, I know my help coming from the Lord. Y'all, y'all just got to. Let me cool it. I got to bring this. Say, bring it, Pastor. Oh, Lord. Oh, Jesus. Here we go. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. That's where we are today. This is the time of terrorist intimidation and fear. But when you walk with God, you can say, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, thou preparest a table in the presence of mine. So what I'm learning is that when I know how to get to God, God knows how to get to me. Oh, come on, somebody. I'm in a situation, and I have to not only pray and praise and give thanks, I got to declare the outcome. Come on, somebody. So I'm up here calling the Lord my shepherd. I'm saying what he's going to do in my life. And I'm, I'm, I'm so confident that even when I walk through my worst day, I'm in my worst day. It's dark. It's dreary. It's an evil day. Things have turned against me. I'm in the valley of the shadow of death. And my enemy has come upon me. But I'm not afraid of my enemy. You, you ready for this? I'm not afraid of my enemy. In fact, I like it. Why you like it? Because my enemy is a signal to me that something's close. Something's close. So instead of me fighting with my enemy, I don't mind sitting down eating with him. I'm going to keep him real close. I'm going to keep him real close because I know when my enemy comes upon me to eat of my flesh, my God will prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemy. So now I'm not dreading my enemies. Why? Because I know that they are nothing but a sign of how close my deliverance is. Somebody's been going through something in this house. I am here to prophesy to you. Yes, God has sustained you through this time and you've been cleansed. But there's another level, if I can get some, some praise out of you and some thanksgiving, there's another level of wholeness that you're about to enter into. Yeah, they took your house, they took your car, they took your job, your family got discombobulated. But if I can just get you to thank them right where you are. That's all I need to do. If I could just get you to thank him in all things. I know stuff is horrible right now. I know stuff is terrible right now. But if I can get you to put that aside, stop letting that be God. Stop letting his desertion be God. Stop letting her betrayal be your God. Stop letting that sit on the crown of your head but instead replace it with thanksgiving and praise. Begin to tell God, I trust in you. I don't lean on men or the strength of horses, but my trust is in the Lord. I wish you'd give somebody a high five and tell them who you trust. Come on, you got to tell somebody. Tell somebody who you trust. When you get in trouble, who you going to call? When things are going down, who you going to call? Don't be a fool and call the thing out. That's what Israel did. They called rape out. They called death out. They called everything that they didn't want. They called it. But I'm here to tell you, call on the Lord. 
and he will answer your prayer and deliver you. Out of every situation, give three people a high five and say, this is it for me. 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 I learned something here. I learned that I got to get crazy. This is what I learned from the blind boy. That when you are experiencing an encounter from God, that you don't just take what you can get and run, but that you go back to the very God that healed you. And you lay down on your face and you start pleading his grace. Thank you for what you're doing right now. Thank you for how you're bringing me out. Thank you for reversing my situation. Thank you for making me everywhere whole. Somebody got to get a revelation that if you can thank him when you can't see it. I wish I had some believers who would worship God and give him thanksgiving. Somebody lift your voice and say, thank you. Thank you for bringing them back. Thank you for making it all right. I don't see nothing yet, but I'm not moved by what I see. I'm only moved by what I believe. And I believe you are a healer. You are a fixer. A heart regulator. You are a deliverer. I believe you'll bring me out of this all right. So I'm going to say thank you. Give three people a high five and say it's done, it's done, it's done. Somebody! 